And I'm very mindful of something one of my namesakes said, the, the late Mary Roberts. And she said, if you ever learn anything in your life, it could be a song, a medicine, a word in our language, you make sure you teach it to at least four other people. And that's how everything keeps going. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Native Minnesota, a podcast about the Native American experience in Minnesota and beyond. I'm your host, Rebecca Crook Stratton. I'm a member of the Shakopee Midwakton Sioux Community, or the SMSC. This podcast is a project of Understand Native Minnesota, a campaign focused on improving the narrative about Native Americans in Minnesota's K-12 school. Today, I'm joined by author, speaker, trainer, and professor, Dr. Anton Troyer. Anton is a professor of Ojibwe at Bemidji State University. He is the author of many books, including Everything You Wanted to Know About Indians But Were Too Afraid to Ask and The Language Warriors Manifesto. He is also very involved in Ojibwe language revitalization efforts and presents trainings on topics like cultural competency and tribal sovereignty. We talk about his passion for the Ojibwe language, his writing, and what projects he has coming up. I hope you enjoy. Well, good afternoon, Anton. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Yourself? I am doing wonderful also. Um, I should call you Dr. Troyer, correct? Anton is fine. Okay. Well, still, I think it's important sometimes in Indian country, we uh, lose some formality, which I think is good. But I also think it's important to acknowledge um, the titles of, of people, especially, you know, some of those Western titles that have prominence, um, it's good to acknowledge our, our people mm. and their accomplishments. So uh, Dr. Troyer, Anton, thank you so much for being here today. Um, you know, it's it's been an honor to, to lead this Understand Native Minnesota campaign, and you have been part of that uh, with our educator academies um, and some other consulting and things. So it has been, you know, just a, a wonderful thing. And I wanted to thank you for, for being a part of that. Um, but you are many things. You are a professor, you're an author, you're an Ojibwe speaker, uh, a trainer. You really have, um, you've gotten to do a lot of really amazing things in your career uh, and have been acknowledged for many of those amazing things. So um, but at the the center of what you do, uh, Ojibwe, Ojibwe culture and language really seems to be, um, you know, prominent in what you care most about. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, why that is and maybe where it started? Yeah, you know, I think for all Indigenous people, part of what it means to be Indigenous is of the land. It's our connection to place and to community. And I think most Americans have a little bit different experience. You know, they, um, somebody might get a job and the job's in California and we celebrate our American freedom to have a malleable identity to become Californian. So as a result, people have a couple kids, they move to two totally different states. They're using Facebook and FaceTime trying to keep it real. But it is so different than for a lot of us in indigenous space where cousins are kind of like siblings, the connection to community and place which is, it's a tether as well as a freedom. Just like a wedding ring is a tether as well as a freedom and a, it's something that can be very liberating. And I feel like that with my native community. So a lot of native academics leave their home communities and move to the ivory tower wherever it happens to be. But I spend about a third of my time at the service of our communities. And I officiated ceremonies from you know naming ceremonies to traditional funerals. You know, all of that work is uncompensated, and it would be impossible for me to do any of that if I were to take a job and move to Harvard or something like that. But uh, so that's that's one of the things that keeps me in my community. But it's also at the heart of both the personal and professional things that I do. So been, I have nine children, been able to raise them all with all of their grandparents within 10 minutes of the front door um, and connected to these things, which to me is very affirming for them in their identity development connections to one another and to our community. But for me too, I, I really do think it takes a village to, you know, raise a kid these days. And I, I really appreciate that. 
And certainly the kinds of success that get celebrated in the Western world, you know, I've been afforded those things too, you know, as part of living in my home space. So I, you know, to me, it feels like a win all the way around. Yeah, um, I think that's amazing. You know, I when you say a lot of indigenous people, you know, they leave their communities and and don't always find their way back. And success stories like yours and that connection, I think, are important to share for sure. Um, so you you teach the Ojibwe language. Um, when you know when did that come about, and when did you decide that you know it was really important that um, some of these languages that you know we don't have a lot of uh, fluent speakers or, um, first language Ojibwe, uh, speakers, you know, what, what made you really want to dive into, to teaching that language? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I stumbled into some of the things I do very much by accident. And I, I'll just preface this by saying, you know, I think a lot of native people have been dealing with a lot of feelings of shame about a lot of things in our history. Um, there's been there have been some horrible chapters in our history, and I don't think it's anybody's fault if they didn't get to grow up in their native community. I don't think it's anyone's fault if they didn't get to grow up with their language handed to them on a silver platter. It doesn't make somebody less than. But at the same time, um, here we are, having been through 500 pretty rough years, and we have to make some decisions about how do we want to spend our time and what do we want to devote our lives and our time too. I finished high school with a thought that a lot of high schoolers have, which is I'm gonna get out of town and never come back. And I stunned myself when I got into Princeton University and very naively thought, hooray, you know, I now can leave the brambled racial borderland behind me. And, you know, these people will be better educated. And it was so naive. I think the first person I met at Princeton said, dude, are you native? Where's your tomahawk? And I remember thinking, oh no, the brambled racial borderland will follow me everywhere I go. These are the dumbest smart people I've ever met. You know, But I stuck it out. I had a great experience. And by the time I had finished college, I had almost the opposite plan that I did when I left home. My plan was to get home and never leave. And in the long run, that is exactly what I ended up doing. Um, I probably you know, freaked my own parents out a little bit because I had an Ivy League education and I told them I am not taking a job. I am not going to graduate school. I'm going to walk the earth. I'm going to hang out with my elders. Their response was, that is beautiful. Good luck paying for that because we are done. And uh, I proceeded, you know, undaunted. I, I went to see Archie Mose, who is really a, a revered spiritual leader. Uh, in Ojibwe country, and he had been born in 1901. He was about 12 years old, the first time he ever saw a white man. He was in his 30s, the first time he saw a black man or a car. And I thought he'd be like, whatever, sitting in a wigwam praying for world peace. I went to see him, and he was sitting in a little modern house watching WWF Smackdown on a TV and laughing really loud. And uh, I remember coming in to see him. I was just stumbling around, but he shut off the TV and he said, oh, I, I've been waiting for you. And I remember thinking, what, what do you mean you're waiting for me? I'm just a kid. You don't even know who I am. But he had a dream about someone. And I, I looked like the person he saw in his dream. And that was enough for him. And he said, you can just sleep on the couch. So I did. And then about 530 in the morning, he's leaning over the couch. Get up. You got to drive me somewhere, get my pipe, grab that drum, put it in the car. Let's go. You know, and that was it. I became his gopher, go for this, go for that. Uh, drive me here, drive me there. And I, you know, never thought it would really take me anywhere. I was just excited to be in the room. Archie spoke Ojibwe quite eloquently. He could hardly speak English. Like he had a, uh, a little check. He used to drive truck for the Polk County Highway Department took him to the bank to cash his check and he he could not endorse his check. He, he didn't know how to sign a name, but uh, they knew who he was and they cashed his check. He never finished second grade, but one of the best educated people I ever met. And one of the things that afforded to me was an opportunity just to be immersed in our language 
and in our culture. I worked hard too um, at all of the things. I, you know, I did take classes. I did record elders. I did transcription and translation work. And um, I, I consider myself an unlikely candidate to be a great speaker of Ojibwe. My father was not native. He spoke German and English well. My mother, you know, was native. Um, but her mom, my grandmother, had been sent to residential boarding school as a child and forbidden to speak the language she knew. Um, so it was a reclamation process for me. And I've just been so excited, happy, and heartened, you know, with where it's kind of like Forrest Gump. Like once he figured out he could run after that, every time he went somewhere, he was running and never thought it would take him anywhere, but it did. And so eventually I did take a job and eventually I did go to graduate school and I did get into academics, but um, through it all, I always kind of kept one foot in the wigwam, so to speak. And even though I've kind of got one in the ivory tower and I've been at the service of our people ever since and trying to transform our educational space into something where our people can learn about who they are as well as the rest of the world. I love that story. You know, you talk about having this wonderful teacher who, you know, might not be educated in the way many people, you know, think education should be, but one of the smartest people, you know. Um, so he was an amazing mentor and teacher. And now you are in that role. Um, you've been a professor at Bemidji State for, uh, what, close to two decades? Over two yeah. decades? Over. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you, you know, take what you learned from your teachers and mentors and translate that into your classroom as a as a teacher? Yes, you know, I I'm at a phase like I'm 54 years old now, so I've got kids and the first few grandkids. Number four is coming in in March, okay. and you know, I still have a few mentors who are older than me, um, including one of Archie's daughters who's well into her 80s. Um, you know, and others, but at the same time, I am getting old enough and I'm being put into positions where I'm being asked to speak for other people and mentor other people who are younger than me. And I'm very mindful of something one of my namesakes said, the, the late Mary Roberts. And she said, if you ever learn anything in your life, it could be a song, a medicine, a word in our language, you make sure you teach it to at least four other people. And that's how everything keeps going. And I've always held on to that and tried to do that. Uh, now that I've been at it long enough, I've learned a lot of songs and I've learned, you know, a lot of words and I'm, you know, doubling my efforts to try to build other people up, especially in our ceremony space too, where it's not as simple as just aspiring to a position like that. Somebody needs to have great integrity, great people skills you know, language, um, music. And sometimes if somebody is missing one of those, it, it's very difficult to, you know, to do that kind of work. So I've been working with a lot of people in a lot of different capacities. Most of that is grassroots and in our ceremony space, but it has been professional too. We used to think and even be told, well, language learning has to start at home because that's how most of our fluent first speakers learned their language was at home. But once you get past the stage where all of your, you know, speakers, like all of the parents are fluent speakers, and you say it has to start at home, you're kind of saying it can never start. So we had to do what many would consider second best and build immersion schools and programs and Rosetta Stone and other tools for advancing the language. And some things with culture don't work that way. Like you got to tell people to go to your elders, not go around your elders and get it from a website or something. Um, so some things don't fit quite as well, but um, we've been trying to build up tools and resources to advance our people and their knowledge of themselves in, in all regards. And I, I think that's very critical work. Yeah. You mentioned um, briefly the Rosetta Stone project and, um, you know, trying to provide tools. Can you talk a little bit about that project? Because I think it's really um you know, inspiring for those of us that are trying to keep our languages going. Yeah, I I am really proud of the efforts that have been made with the development of Rosetta Stone and even some of the literacy initiatives that were kind of funded and stewarded as part of the same effort. So I, a little bit before the pandemic, maybe a year or two before the pandemic, I was called to a meeting in Mille Lacs. 
And most people know Mille Lacs is right in the middle of central Minnesota. It's the southernmost of the Ojibwe tribes in our state. And, you know, they're a successful gaming tribe, not quite at the level of Shakopee, but um, they've done some amazing things with their with their investments, you know, like saving half of their money from dollar one for the casino to the point where their endowment eclipses gaming as a revenue stream and a diversified business plan. They've supported ceremonial spaces. Um, they still do all the things all of our sovereign governments do in trying to steward and marshal resources and apply them to the betterment of their people. And they brought me to this meeting and they said, look, we did a language survey and we've identified only 25 remaining fluent first speakers of the language on our reservation. And their tribe has, I think, you know, a little over 6,000 tribal members. Um, and they were all elders over 70. And they said, we've put some money aside and we also have some other dollars, carryover funds and grants, even for things like workforce development and things like that. And we'd like to brainstorm how could you do workforce development around developing our workforce to be good at Ojibwe and things like that? And so, uh, which in and of itself was an innovative application of workforce development funds, because usually we're just, you know, creating job programs and things like that. They're saying, let's indigenize the creation of jobs. So at that point in time, um, they had a pretty substantial chunk of money. And I, I said, look, um, it's not realistic to send all 25 elders back to school for five years to get teaching degrees and have them work for you for another 30 years. I, I said, we're going to have to do some other things. So I proposed, uh, let's develop Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone, for those who aren't familiar, is a language teaching tool. So kind of like Duolingo or Babbel, there are a number of these platforms. Um, it uses a combination of video, audio, talking flashcards, and artificial intelligence so it can correct, correct your pronunciation as you interact with the app um, and even grammar as you interact with the app in real time. Um, it can push the language to people wherever they're at on planet Earth through a smartphone. Uh, and all of that's you know, super exciting. And then also said, let's do a literacy initiative. Let's develop some books in our language by our people. Uh, and they looked around and they said, let's do all of it. And we got to work and, you know, we had a lot of partnerships. Like we partnered with the Minnesota Historical Society Press. And for the first time in their history, they published books that no one on their staff could read because they were entirely in a tribal language, which showed a high level of faith and confidence in, you know, the team that we had assembled. Uh, we, and we produced the first five Ojibwe books. We started working on Rosetta Stone. The pandemic hit. We had to send all the elders home with one of their grandkids and a computer and start doing work by Zoom, some of which was sometimes even hilarious. Like one time I called uh, Carol Nickerboy, and she's one of the elders. And uh, I said, hey, Asin, it's time for our language work. I got my coat on, I'm going to the casino. I said, casino, there's a pandemic. You're supposed to stay home. She said, well, the language is more important. Let's work. So. We sat down, worked for a couple hours, and then she said, I'm going to the casino now. My niece has been waiting in the car the whole time. <laughs> but that's kind of how they were, like super dedicated, you know, drop everything for the language. And the pandemic was tough. You know, we lost six of those 25 elders at Mille Lacs. That's over 20% of the fluent speakers. And, you know, we, it took us a while when we came out of the uh, pandemic. You know, we had a team, still a team of about 50 people working on that. And we had our launch event and we asked Joe Naquinabe to speak. He's one of the elders in Mille Lacs, a ceremonial drum chief. His sister died from COVID. His brother had COVID and had heart complications and passed away. And I thought he would just say this is the toughest time of our lives. But he kind of floored me. And he said, you know, we've been through a lot. We've been through a lot the past few years. We've been through a lot the past few hundred years. But I got to say that seeing all these young people coming around, seeing what we've been able to build, knowing that our elders will be teaching people our language for hundreds of years to come, I have to say that this has been the happiest time of my life. Wow. I couldn't believe it. And some of the other things, like some questions that sometimes come up around um, 
something like this where like, you know, Rosetta Stone's a non-native company. Are you going to give them a copyright and intellectual property rights over, you know, our colonization or our work and our language? And who's going to, are they going to profiteer off our misery and things like that? So I was very proud too, that we structured the contract in such a way that we just paid Rosetta Stone for a service. The tribe retains copyrights. They collect all of the revenues. It's free for tribal members. There's a nominal fee of $25 for other indigenous people, 100 bucks for institutions. And even with that little amount of money, they should actually recuperate their entire investment over the life of the project. Um, and they can repurpose anything they want, use it however they want. Um, you know, we structured the contract with punitive escape clauses so nobody could pull the plug on it when we're halfway through a multi-year development. And so now we got the first two years out, year three should be out in March and another year every year until we've got a six year development, which then also allows the tribe to say to everybody who works for the Mille Lacs band, working for our native nation is a privilege. And we expect everybody who works here to demonstrate this level of competency in the tribal language. Here's the tool to do it. The assessments are built into the tool, you know, and so it's sovereignty and a lot of other things in the application of the tools. If Anton has inspired you to learn more about the Ojibwe language and culture, his Ojibwe Word of the Day series is a great place to start. On his social media channels, he posts short videos for different Ojibwe words each day. You can find links in our episode description. Wow, that's incredible. Um, I, I'm definitely going to have to check that out for sure. I, I haven't actually seen the product, but... Um, the story behind it is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so glad to hear that. So you also um, have done some other things um, on your own. And I believe this was prior to the Rosetta Stone project. But um, you have a Ojibwe word of the day uh, that you put online and another tool for folks to use uh, and engage a little bit with the language. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that one came to be? Yeah, I, you know, we're just looking for everything we can think of that will make the language accessible, approachable, and fun. Uh, so, let, you know, word of the day are just like short snippets that um, I ended up doing these with my daughter, Madeline, who also speaks and teaches Ojibwe. And uh, that's just been fun, just freely shared on, you know, there's a YouTube channel and, uh, um, you know, shared on social media, TikTok, things like that. And people have been really loving it and sharing it around. And it just puts a little splash of the language into their lives every day. Fun, positive, easy, accessible. Uh, for the most part, we embrace technology for proliferating the language. It's, um, you know, and any kind of teaching tool that can be useful for that. Even a lot of my classes now, we teach HyFlex. So they're online, you know, through a Zoom classroom and in person at the same time. And we got students joining from all over the place. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to access their language and culture. That's fantastic. Well, I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about you as an author. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, many people know your book, everything you wanted to know about Indians, but were too afraid to ask. Um, I see it in schools and um, on bookshelves. And, you know, that one's kind of everywhere. You also have another one coming out uh, here this beginning of the summer that I'd like to talk a little bit about. But tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got into writing and and why why are you an author? Yeah, I I stumbled into that one, too. Really, you know, from the story I was sharing earlier about connecting with Archie and then, you know, I started recording him just telling stories, what it was like when I was a kid. And I worked with Melvin Eagle, Jim Clark, you know, lots of other people. And, and the first works that I published were um, stories from elders told in the language with some English translation. And I, I think it affirmed for me that, you know, although a lot of people aren't getting their entertainment from books the way we used to, that it's a powerful lever where we can share these voices really in perpetuity. And we can leave our elders in charge of what they want to share and how and things like that. And I've been publishing works ever since. So I've, I'm over 20 books now. Some of those include language works, um, stories and things like that. Uh, but 
I'm, and I actually, my PhD is in history. So a few of the books are history books. I was asked by the uh, Red Lake tribe to do a tribal history for them. So that was a big archival research. And sometimes I even do like expert testimony for tribes around the, the history part of my work. But uh, I also like the everything you wanted to know about Indians, but were afraid to ask book really like, I think as native people, we stumble into a lot of the same questions, you know? So the easy, or I should say basic first ones, like, is it Indian, Native American, Aboriginal, Indigenous, First Nation person or what, you know? Uh, but also what is sovereignty and why do natives have it? And how does that work? And so you mean you're not just another racial group or ethnic group, it's a political identity. What does that mean? So, you know, um, what are, what is happening with indigenous language revitalization or culture? Or what about social activism? What do you think about mascots? You know, the, all these questions would pop up. So I started saving questions and I, I realized that I knew what it was like living in my body and being brown in a native place and things like that. But I, that didn't mean I was an expert on everything about our history you know, or all things native in all spaces. Like I got a house full of natives. I don't even know what they're thinking half the time. So as I started gathering questions, I had to hunt for answers, you know, and in many ways I'm still hunting. But as I did, I started giving talks and said, you know, here's what I know. Here's what I don't. You can ask questions. If I don't know, I'll say, I don't know. And if I know, I'll do my best to answer. And I think, you know, my disposition to that part of the work was well received because it was positive and open um, and willing to give a meaningful answer rather than just an angry rebuke. But, it, you know, it's unflinching too when it comes to the issues and needs of our people. And that took off and started taking me all over the place and eventually turned into a book and a new edition and a young reader edition. And, um, and so I've been really heartened um, I initially thought, oh, this will be good for non-native people who need to know something about us. But so many of our own people are also hungry for information and even tools to answer the questions that we are bombarded with. You know, I've been especially heartened by how well received it's been in the native community. Yeah, I think, you know, in the native community, as somebody who, you know, when I picked up that book, I thought well, I can probably answer a lot of these questions, too. But it was so nice to, you know, have something you could connect to that, you know, you understand it's like, oh, I get these questions, same questions too. And I am glad I'm not the only one. And I'm glad somebody is, you know, answering these uh, in a very thoughtful way. So I definitely appreciated that book. Mm -hmm. um, your new book, uh, Where Wolves Don't Die, is scheduled to come out this June. Can you tell us a little, give us a little sneak peek about that one? Oh, I am so excited for this book. I I just branched out into a totally different kind of writing with this one, you know, where everything you wanted to know about Indians, I'm kind of answering questions. And with history books, there is a craft to telling history in an engaging way. But with all the footnoting and things like that, it's a very different kind of kind of writing. And so this is actually my first novel. So while I've been telling stories, both in person, in ceremonies, and in my professional work in different ways, you know, for, for decades, um, I put together a novel. And I honestly think it is the best thing I've ever written. Uh, it was a very different, you know, different type of project for me and different kind of writing. But it is a young reader novel. It's the story of a young uh, Native kid who it begins in Minneapolis, uh, who, you know, has an altercation at school. And he's kind of like looking for clues to a murder, but his family sends him to their family's equivalent of juvie to go run a trap line with his grandfather in the Canadian wilderness. And so it's really a tender coming of age story. That's also an unflinching look at the things we have and continue to deal with, and also a top thriller all at the same time. And uh, I experimented in the books, you know, it's a young reader book kind of written for high school audience, but I think it works for everyone. But I read it out loud in drafts to my children. So, you know, the 12 year old, 14 year old, the 16 year old. And that showed me a lot too, because usually the kids like after two minutes would yawn and like 
grab their phones or something. And they were, they were hanging on the edge of their seats and who do you think did it? And what's going to happen next? And there's a little love interest through there and stuff. That, so I was just like looking at what they had to say was very exciting. And uh, not too many people have seen it yet because it comes out in June, but um, Louise Erdrich had a look at it and she was really excited and just gushing praise. So I think all of those things bode well for where the, where the book might go in the future. Well, I am definitely adding it to my list. I just finished Warrior Girl Unearthed. Yeah. Uh, and yes, again, another young reader's book, but sometimes you just need to pick up something you can get through quick. Uh, and that was really good. So this definitely piques my interest. I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition to, to teaching and writing, um, you do a lot of speaking engagements and um, trainings for for folks, including educators. And, you know, here we're talking about, you know, understand Native Minnesota and educators. What are some of the topics you train on? A variety of things. Um, so sometimes my work is right in the DEI space. Um, how do we talk about tough topics, which frankly, like this is a tough time in our country for educators as well as everybody else. We have more than we've ever seen before, people with no training in education telling educators how to do their jobs. Um, we've seen that space get politicized in a way that it really hasn't before. We've seen efforts at book banning and things like that that we haven't really seen before, as if there's ever been a time in the history of humans when the book banners were like the good guys. Um, and all of that's very troubling. So, you know, educators kind of feel like they're tippy toeing around on eggshells. Minnesota is a very purple state politically. And, you know, I, I mean, I sit on the governing board for the Minnesota State Historical Society. We are equally populated with Democrats and Republicans and have to, you know, work together and get along and, you know, be productive rather than adversarial. But it's easier to say than do. So some of the work is how do we talk about tough topics in a way that is not overly politicized, but is productive so that we contend to the educational development and success of all the kids who are going to school. There should not be a racial predictability to discipline, but there is. There should not be a racial predictability to test scores, but there is. You know, there should not be a racial predictability to how well funded a school district is, but there is. And ultimately, we need to talk about those sometimes uncomfortable topics in a way that's healthy and positive and productive. So some of the work is around those sort of things, tools for understanding the issues, for speaking to them, and for taking meaningful action, you know, in mixed company that everyone can get behind. Um, some of it is around native specific content development. Like most Americans got a sugar-coated version of Chris Columbus in the first Thanksgiving. They don't have a lot more to more deeply understand the first people of the land. So we get imagined a lot and understood very little. And a lot of times, if there's an educator, you know, with a good heart who wants to do well by all the students, they might be thinking, if I say this, you know, then people of Italian American heritage might be really upset with me. And if I say that, I, have you ever seen an angry native mom? What am I going to do as little as possible? And then the result is, that the educational response ends up being more about the racial comfort of a teacher rather than the needs of a kid. So how do we build people up to more deeply understand, um, you know, and, and to know how to engage with these things? Um, a lot of times the work, you know, it's not just in K-12, I do work with higher ed, um, sometimes businesses, law enforcement, things like that, each which have their own distinct um, issues, concerns, um, you know, blessings and uh, barriers. And so uh, the work kind of varies a little bit. Sometimes it's also how do we do work with tribal people and also directly with tribes? Because even in the state of Minnesota, tribes can be structured in very different ways. You know, the Red Lake tribe, you got seven hereditary chiefs, you know, who serve for life, who are sitting with democratically elected representatives together. They are the tribal council and they will expect everything significant you know, that's affecting, you know, their tribe to come through a tribal council meeting. And in Mille Lacs, you know, you've got a separate corporate commission that handles all business operations and 
separated executive, legislative, judicial stuff, and they really don't want the tribal council to be micromanaging business decisions. And a lot of times people just think, send a letter to the tribal chair, not realizing the tribal chair is running many millions of dollars in businesses every year and cannot respond to every single well-intended email that they get, you know? And so just helping people understand who and how to connect with and, um, you know, to be effective, um, what they need to know to build relationships um, in positive and constructive ways and things like that. So it kind of varies a bit, but a uh, pretty broad spectrum, I think, of things related to the Native experience tribes and, you know, race and DEI stuff. Right. Well, as we wrap up here, um, you know, you have an immense amount of knowledge. Um, but when it comes to Native issues and, you know, I'm thinking about our educators right now, uh, you know, we've heard a lot as we've gone through this campaign and done our listening sessions. And there's, you know, some teachers that are very nervous about teaching this sort of content because of lack of training or, um, you know, lack of quality resources or not knowing how to vet resources. Um, what would be your advice to our non-Native teachers? You know, I would say, first of all, be brave and keep leaning in. Here we are, you know, humans have been messing things up for thousands of years. It's not going to fix itself. And so we just need to engineer and be the change we want to see in the world. So if we want peace, if we want to get along, then we have to demonstrate peace and we have to show what it looks like to get along. If we want to be well informed. That's not going to drop out of the sky. We have to actually do the work, which means read the books and check out the podcasts and, you know, do the thing. You know, as Native people, we, you know, have to stay engaged too. That means not be so angry, even though there, there's enough to make you angry for 500 years more, you know, but to stay engaged, to be productive partners in the conversation, you know, we, we can't be everybody else's brain, but we can represent ourselves and our communities well. We can connect people to tools, information, resources, you know, and be constructive partners in all of the work. For the non-native teachers, then they need to look for those native voices and hold them up and in vetting material. I realize that's tough for everybody, you know, but when you look for things like as a general rule of thumb, native inspired stuff will probably get you into trouble. Native, you know, led stuff will probably be done well. Native led means there'll be native voices that are leading the effort. There will be authenticity to the content, to the people who are delivering it. That doesn't mean that as native people, we are omniscient or get it all right 100% of the time, but you will have more accurate and more authentic information and guidance. Um, and a lot of tribes, a lot of organizations, you know, that are native led and a lot of native people are putting their voices, content and guidance out there. Certainly understand native Minnesota is a great example of that, you know, teacher academies to train people. There are a couple of them upcoming yet this spring, um, you know, uh, endorsements and sharing of books and curricular materials, you know, a new resource list that'll be coming out. All of those things are great ways to kind of help move faster through what do we pay attention to? You know, used, the problem used to be, how do I find a needle in a haystack? Now it's like, which needle in the stack of needles do I actually pay attention to? And I think that will get better, but we have to tune in and, uh, and we have to do our part of the lift, no matter what our background is and how much experience we have. I think that's great advice to end on. And I just want to say again, uh, Dr. Troyer, thank you so much for being with us today and um, wishing you the best of luck in whatever you got going on next. Thank you so much. I'm so deeply appreciative of your personal leadership around Understand Native Minnesota. Um, you know, you, I can tell you care so passionately about building up our educators and the well-being of, of Native children and all children. And I think it's putting a lot of good into the world. So I'm honored to be in community with you and everyone else who's been part of this initiative. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for the Native Minnesota podcast. For more episodes, please subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can also visit our website, understandnativemn.org, to learn more about our campaign's work to improve the Native narrative in Minnesota's public schools.